Hello, thanks for dropping by today, where we're going to be discussing hypercalcemia. So what is the, the uh, general definition of hypercalcemia? Hypercalcemia is defined by any uh, serum calcium level that is greater than 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. So whenever you see this fact, um, by definition, you have hypercalcemia. So let's first begin with how the body, uh, different mechanisms the body uses to maintain a normal serum uh, calcium level. So uh, of course, uh, where do you get uh, calcium from? Well, from the gut. So um, calcium intake, uh, so oral calcium intake uh, goes in through your GIT and it gets absorbed primarily in the duodenum. And from the duodenum, it goes into the extracellular fluid. Okay, now within the extracellular fluid, all of the ca uh, calcium is not free. Um, actually, 45% of it is bound to albumin and other proteins and about 55% of it is ionized. Now this this bound portion right here the, the, that's bound to albumin it's inactive because it's bound to albumin it cannot uh, work with any reactions it cannot shift through different uh, uh, d different systems and so this is you know this is not considered uh, if this is elevated it, it will be asymptomatic. However, the 55% ionized is considered physiologically active. And this is the part of the uh, calcium that will actually, if it's high or low in other instances, uh, can actually lead to symptoms of uh, hypercalcemia. And so uh, from the uh, ECF, the greatest reservoir of calcium is going to be your bone. So your bone contains uh, somewhere up to 98% of the body's calcium. So of course we have large bones, and it's re restoring all the calcium. And so whenever your body needs to increase or decrease the EC of calcium, the biggest reservoir is going to be from the bone. So if you if you suddenly have a low ca calcium in the ECF, the bone will break down to, get, to increase the ECF volume. Or if you have high calcium in the ECF, it'll go towards the bone and you'll just build more bone. And of course, uh, there's a lot of intracellular calcium, primarily in your muscles, uh, and, and for other reasons, you, you know, to, uh, for synaptic vesicles and all these things. And this is also going to exchange between the ECF. So we've, we've talked about, uh, you know, uh, where you get calcium from, different compartments calcium exchanges with. How do you excrete calcium? Um, calcium is primarily excreted from the kidneys. So, um, you know, fr from reabsorption and secretion in the kidneys, uh, you will lose calcium. And also, I mean, you lose calcium from the kidneys. And also, uh, when, you know, the calcium that you take in, not all of it gets reabsorbed. Actually, up to 80% of your calcium from your GIT actually goes out in your feces. So this is your general overlook of the, the, the way calcium shifts in and out of different compartments. Well, what influences the calcium to move? So let's talk about a scenario where a patient has low calcium levels. So when you have, when the patient has low calcium levels, this gets sensed by something called the calcium, uh, calcium sensing receptor. Uh, this calcium sensing receptor is found on the, primarily on the parathyroid gland, although there is some on the uh, kidneys as well. So the parathyroid gland is uh, located in your thyroid, which is uh, right uh, above uh, anterior to your trachea. And it's four little nodules uh, within your thyroid. So it's kind of embedded in there. And so when, when the uh, calcium sensing receptor activates one of your parathyroid glands, the parathyroid gland, of course, is going to secrete parathyroid. Now, the parathyroid has several different effects. One of those effects is going to be on the bone. So it's going to stimulate the bone to increase the osteoclast activity. Okay, and this is a little bit more complicated, but for now, I think if you just uh, understand that you increase osteoclast activity, uh, that should be enough. And so oste what does osteoclast do? Osteoclast breaks down bones. So what you'll end up having is you're going to have a breakdown of bones. So more calcium is going to go into the ECF and that's going to help you restore your calcium levels. Uh, besides that, the, the parathyroid hormone also directly affects the kidneys. So in the kidneys, uh, when parathyroid is uh, active upon it, uh, you get increased calcium reabsorption and you get decreased phosphate reabsorption, or in other words, you get increased secretion of phosphate. So, the, so, you, so far we have two effects, one on the bone and one on the kidneys. And finally, uh, there's an indir indirect effect on the GIT. So within the kidneys, so again, parathyroid is going to activate an uh, enzyme in the kidney called 1-alpha-hydroxylase. And one alpha hydroxylase is going to activate your vitamin D. So uh, it's going to increase your vitamin D levels. And then the vitamin D will then go work on the duodenum 
to increase the reabsorption of uh, calcium from the GIT. So you can see we have three primary, primary mechanisms of restoring calcium. One is by breaking down bones, the other one is decreasing uh, excretion through the kidneys, and the third one is increasing reabsorption through the GIT system. So this is a general overlook of the uh, uh, physiology. Now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll move forward and let's talk about the different types of causes that you may see, in other words etiology, of hypercalcemia. So one of the main causes is going to be uh, hyperparathyroidism. Now hyperparathyroidism comes in three different types. Uh, we have primary, which is due to an adenoma. Uh, and interestingly enough, with an adenoma, it's generally going to be less than 11 milligrams per deciliter. So these patients will generally be asymptomatic or they just have some non-specific symptoms. And so, uh, and, and generally when it's, uh, it's, it's not going to be discovered unless you do some type of uh, routine lab work. Uh, there's also secondary hyperparathyroidism. Now, this is due to renal failure. So when you have renal failure, oftentimes the, the patient will tend to lose a lot of calcium. And so this will cause in, uh, increased release of parathyroid hormone. And this eventually will lead to parathyroid hyperplasia. Okay, and then finally we have uh, tertiary uh, hyperparathyroidism. And this is when renal failure leads to an autonomous parathyroid, horm uh, parathyroid gland. And so regardless of how much calcium the, the patient has, he's going to keep continue to excrete uh, parathyroid hormone. So this is the, uh, one of the major causes. The other major cause is going to be due to a malignancy. So uh, you know, as you know, perineoplastic syndromes, uh, hypercalcemia is one of the most common perineoplastic syndromes that you may find. Uh, so one, one cause of the malignancy is, is basically the uh, tumor metastasizes to the bone. And this is going to be an osteolytic type of metastasis rather than an osteoblastic. So in osteolytic, uh, the tumor is actually breaking down bone, whereas in osteoblastic, it's actually building up bone. And so uh, the most common tumors that you want to think of when you think of osteolytic metastasis is either going to be breast cancer uh, keep in, uh, and, and also multiple myeloma. So multiple myeloma, I mean, uh, it's generally, it's not due to de uh, necessarily to a metastasis, it's due to uh, release of different types of cytokines. And so the two types of cytokines that are most commonly involved is going to be interleukin-1 and TNF. So these are going to be the, uh, when the tumor metastasizes, it releases these hormones, which leads to osteolysis. Okay, the other types of tumors, uh, I guess mechanism of tumors to release uh, in, uh, higher calcium is going to be ectopic uh, parathyroid hormone production. Okay, so which tumors do this? Uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the lungs uh, can definitely release uh, PTH, causing hypercalcemia. Um, ovarian cancers can do this, uh, uh, the uh, pari, uh, primary neuroendocrine tumors can do this, uh, or sorry, primitive neuroendocrine tumors, uh, pancreatic cancers can cause uh, ectic, ectopic parathyroid hormone, and also thyroid papillary carcinoma as well. They, can, they also create ectopic PTH, which eventually leads to hypercalcemia. Now, besides ectopic PTH, there's another uh, peptide, which is called the parathyroid hormone related peptide and parathyroid hormone related peptide binds to the PTH receptor activating it which will then increase calcium and then that will decrease the PTH so this is not PTH in of itself it's just related to it uh, binding to that uh, PTH receptor uh, common tumors that can cause this uh, uh, is going to be primarily going to be your non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and CML which is going to be a lymphoma and a leukemia uh, squamous cell carcinomas, carcinomas of the lung, head, and neck. Uh, renal, car renal carcinoma. Uh, you also have bladder carcinoma and ovarian carcinoma. So uh, a few tumors that can re release this parathyroid hormone-related peptide. And finally, um, some tumors can release vitamin D. So of course, vitamin D increases reabsorption in the gut. And this is going to be your uh, Hodgkin and Hod non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And the and also ovarian dysgerminoma. Now, these two, uh, the hyperparathyroidism and malignancies, are the most common causes of hypercalcemia. Up to ninety percent of cases of uh, hypercalcemia can be explained by either of these two mechanisms. So, the, when you see a patient with hypercalcemia, this is generally what uh, you want to first focus on. Of course, there are other causes. Uh, granulomatous diseases um, is another cause, uh, and these are going to be diseases such as like sarcoidosis. Uh, uh, TB, uh, borreliosis, and, and the way they work is uh, the macrophages begin to activate uh, vitamin D. And so you, here you have uh, high vitamin D levels. Um, there are also a few hormones 
uh, that can lead to hypercalcemia, so uh, hyperthyroidism, uh, high growth hormone, which will be found in acromegaly, uh, pheochromocytoma, I'm going to just uh, write pheo, uh, adrenal insufficiency, um, of course, as we know, vitamin D toxication, we already know that, but also vitamin A toxication can cause it um, as well. So these, these are going to be the general hormones type of things, although vitamins you know, can sometimes be considered hormones, sometimes not. Um, now let's move on to the next uh, category, which is going to be drugs. So drugs definitely can cause uh, hypercalcemia. Thiazides cause hypercalcemia uh, because of the increased reabsorption um, in the kidneys. Uh, of course, you have lithium and then again, theophylline. Okay, so now, um, now the next thing we can turn our attention to is a kind of a familial syndrome. Uh, it is known as familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. And so what this syndrome uh, is about is there is an increased requirement uh, for um, the amount of calcium required to inhibit parathyroid hormone. So basically, normally you require, say, uh, you know, 10.5 uh, milligrams per deciliter to inhibit parathyroid. Now you need more. You have to need 12 or 13. So the more that's required, uh, obviously the, the higher calcium is going to be. And it's, it's generally going to be a mutation with that uh, calcium sensing receptor. Uh, that we mentioned early, earlier. And again, calcium sensing receptor is also found in the kidneys. So you, you have increased reabsorption of the kidneys, and that's why you get hypocalciuric uh, uh, part of that uh, disease. And finally, uh, immobilization is a, it's a rare cause, but it's worth mentioning. And with immobilization, of course, you're not using your bones as much, so you're going to have that uh, kind of break atrophy of the bones, and that, that's going to increase the calcium levels. Okay, so that's going to be the general causes. Uh, now let's go ahead and uh, switch our focus to the clinical aspect. So uh, the best mnemonic that I've heard for this, um, or kind of memorizing the device, is uh, stones, groans, and psychological overtones. And, and remember when I was taking my steps, uh, and I was, I was doing a lot of those uh, U-Assembly step questions, uh, these three, when I saw those, it was, I definitely knew you had hypercalcemia. And so you could definitely use these. And so we'll go in detail what each means. So stones is going to be your uh, kidney stones. Groans is going to be bone pains. And then psychological overtones is going to be some of the neuropsychological uh, symptoms that develop. And we're going to go over that uh, in a little bit. Um, but for, your, for the sake of USMLE, as soon as you see this, you have hypercalcemia. But in, you know, I guess in the clinicals and in, in your uh, work, uh, generally, if the patient has less than 12 milligrams per deciliter, they're usually asymptomatic besides some non-specific symptoms such as uh, constipation and, and some generalized weakness. So less than 12 generally tends to be asymptomatic and it's found incidentally on, on lab findings. Now, when you get to the 12 to 14 milligrams per deciliter, um, if the patient has chronic, I mean, it, it develops slowly over time, this is generally well tolerated and it tends to be a little bit more asymptomatic or they have these uh, non-specific symptoms, but if it's acute, then they do become symptomatic, and so they tend to have these uh, symptoms here. And when it's, when it's greater than 14 milligrams per deciliter, then they're definitely symptomatic, and it tends to be a little bit more severe uh, than even even this range here. So let's go over exactly what these stones, groans, and psychological overtones means. So first of all, with stones, that kind of points to renal symptoms. So of course, kidney stones, right? But besides that, there are other effects on the kidneys such as uh, you get renal tubular acidosis type 1, which is a problem with the distal, uh, distal side uh, uh, reabsorption of the uh, protons. This can also develop nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and this develops a polyuria, polydipsia. So that's another type of thing you want to look for in hypercalcemia, and eventually uh, renal insufficiency. So uh, the, the calcium can start depositing in the interstitium, and that can cause uh, eventual insufficiency. Uh, groans, that's going to be musculoskeletal. So you do get bone pain, and that's because when you, usually when someone, uh, a patient has high calcium, it, it's taken down from the bone. There's, there's bone uh, breakdown. So that, they develop pain from that because the cortex is getting uh, thinner. Uh, finally, neuropsychiatric symptoms. So these are definitely uh, kind of prominent. They have these cognitive problems, uh, they are sometimes confused, and they even have stupor. So when you see these, you want to think of uh, hypercalcemia. Besides stone groans and psychological overtones, there's, there's a few other things you want to keep in mind. Uh, there are some GIT symptoms, so constipation, and sometimes the groan does, it does stand for abdominal pain secondary to constipation. Uh, anorexia, uh, pancreatitis, hypercalcemia is a cause of pancreatitis, 
and peptic ulcer. And, and people aren't sure why that's the case, but uh, it does seem to be related to having peptic ulcer. Uh, and there's finally, there's some cardiovascular symptoms. Uh, they do get short QT interval, and um, the calcium can develop the uh, deposit in the vessel, which can lead to things like heart, hypertension and MI, if obviously if, if it involves the coronary artery. So that's your general uh, clinical symptoms. And so you can see it's uh, pretty straightforward. Again, this mnemonic is great. I used it a lot on my exam, board exams, and uh, it was very helpful. And just kind of, I don't know, keep these two in mind as well. Okay, so let's go on to treatment here. Um, so treatment for hypercalcemia, generally if the, they have less than 14 or they're asymptomatic, um, all you do, you don't give any treatment, you just have them avoid aggravating factors. So this can be things such as drugs, such as thiazide, lithium, just discontinue those. Or, uh, you know, if they say they're immobilized, you start getting them to walk around a little bit, and, and you always want to give them increased fluids. Uh, this will help kind of dilute and prevent the renal stones uh, from the kidneys. Now, if they have greater than 14, uh, then uh, uh, the hypercalcemia, the serum level is greater than 14, sorry. Uh, there's kind of three main treatments here. Uh, first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to hydrate them. So you give saline hydration IV. You're going to want to give them calcitonin, and you're going to want to give them bisphosphonates. So this is the kind of the, the triple uh, therapy there. Uh, so saline hydration, uh, why do you want to give this? Well, it's protective for the kidneys. It's going to prevent kidney stones, and, and if there are kidney stones already, it's going to wash it out. Also, there is some salt wasting that occurs, and so it's going to correct that as well. Uh, calcitonin uh, increases calcium excretion, but this takes about four to six hours to start working, so that's why you want to start the hydration right away. And interesting thing about calcitonin is uh, after around 48 hours, you get down regulation of the receptors. So after two days, it doesn't even work anymore. And so what you want to do then is you want to start the bisphosphonates. Uh, the, the one that's used right now, the most potent one, is going to be uh, zolindronic acid. Uh, and this starts to work after two to four days. So the nice thing is, as this stops working, this then will kick in and kind of replace the calcitonin. So that kind of works interestingly. Uh, uh, interesting. Uh, and what does bisphosphonates do? They're osteoclast inhibitors. And this is preferred for uh, malignancy associated. Remember we talked about... Uh, how the metastasis and, and those those issues, uh, and but this is co um, uh, contraindication is chronic kidney disease, and for these patients we prefer to give donisumab. Uh, donisumab, if you don't know, if you're not familiar with, is a rank L uh, antagonist, I guess, or decoy receptor. I, I can't forget. Oh no, it's an antibody against rank L, and rank L also uh, uh, can uh, increase um, osteoclast, and so this will inhibit that. Um, Besides that, um, other types of treatment, you can you give glucocorticoids if it's a granulomatous disease. Because remember, in granulomatous disease, it's the macrophages that are the issues. They're, they're kind of activating vitamin D, so uh, decreasing the macrophages definitely helps. Uh, Sinicalcet is a calcium mimetic, and so what this does is it makes the parathyroid believe that there's more calcium than there actually is. And so this is definitely used for parathyroid carcinomas uh, and parathyroid-related uh, diseases. And, um, and and the finally dialysis. This is a last resort uh, type of thing. And what you, what they do is when they give dialysis, they just don't give them any calcium or give them very little calcium, and that slowly brings the calcium level down. And this is reserved for patients uh, who have renal insufficiency, because these patients, you know, may need dialysis anyways, because their kidneys aren't working. So just as they're getting dialysis, they just go ahead and fix the calcium issue as well. So uh, that about wraps up our discussion on hypercalcemia. I uh, hope you enjoyed and you learned a lot, and I hope to see you in my future videos. Take care. Bye.